voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock from us like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with him. Here I go. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. From the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning at the first verse. Mark writes, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, Make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all of the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Lord, we ask your blessings upon this word. Send forth your Holy Spirit to open our hearts <coughs> and our minds to all that you have for us. We bless our children as they head back for Children's Church and pray a mighty anointing over them and the future generations. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. I'm going to invite those of our our uh, safety team that are able to come, those who are in our safety team, who are able to come and just to be part of our worship, be in here during worship, uh, whoever is able to be freed up from our worship team, uh, this is a message that I do not want to be missed by anyone, because I believe that it's uh, from the heart of the Lord. And uh, I don't want anyone to miss out on it. Would you hire John the baptizer as your next pastor? I mean, he's a little out there. And I don't know that he's always going to say everything you want him to say. But look better, let me ask you this. Would you allow John the baptizer to date your daughter? I mean, he shows up at your door, knocks at your door, and 
and you open your door and there's this guy and he hasn't had a, a haircut or a shave. He's wearing camel's hair with a belt around his waist. And he smells like locusts and wild honey. He's got that kind of breath. You never know what's coming out of his mouth. He's a straight shooter. Would you allow him to date your daughter? I mean, this, this guy probably looks like, you know, by his description and his eating habits, it's kind of like Gene Simmons and Lady Gaga have a love child. <laughs> Good, three of you got that. That's really good. Okay, so Gene Simmons, I don't know, you know who he was, who he is. There he is. We have such an incredible vision of him. Can't you just about see him? Maybe he looks a little bit like Tom Hanks in Castaway with his hair bleached from being out in the sun for so long and his, his skin is kind of leathery. Now I know that in The Chosen, they have a way of, have you seen The Chosen? Yes. Yeah. What do they call him? Crazy John, right? <laughs> but he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. He's the first of the New Testament evangelists. He's the last of the Old Testament prophets saying, repent. <laughs> And the first of the New Testament evangelists saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there he is. There's very little warm and fuzzy about John. To the everyday folk, though, he's a hope. He's a voice for the downtrodden. But for the religious, for the religious leaders of his day, John was absolutely a straight shooter. He speaks the truth to injustice. But he also speaks and has a voice for holy living. He's an advocate for pure relationships. And when he sees relationships that are out of line with God's greatest desires, he's going to address it. And it doesn't matter who it happens to be, including the king of Israel at that time. He is going to speak to that, regardless of the cost. John represents a life completely sold out. He represents a life of no compromise. He's part of a community called the Essenes. And these folks are known for being completely sold out. They're people of extremes. Extreme in their study of scripture. Extreme in their austerity. Extreme in their approach to, to possessions. They have very little. And that's hard for us to identify with, to be honest. His weird diet, for example, isn't really conducive. I mean, to get togethers with pizza and soda and having people over and being together and enjoying yourself and being able to share each other and maybe have a, you know, tipping a brew or something and hanging out and watching a game. Not John. When you have a diet of locusts and wild honey, that's not necessarily a diet that says, come on over. I'd love to do that. How many of you would take John's invitation to come for dinner? Maybe the wild honey part. But the locust, the bug, who's in the eating bugs? I don't care that some commentators say, oh, well, that could have been a 
C, I don't care. <laughs> Are you willing to be that soul out? Has anything happened to you that would convince you so much that the path you are on, you need to be completely on a different path and you would completely experience a God trajectory that would move you in a different way? And everybody seems to be, ah, oh, you know, it's easy. Go on with the flow. No problem. Don't worry. Be happy. That was a John. John is out there and he's sun baked. He's not worried about keto or paleo or gluten free or peanut allergies. Everybody said amen. John is completely milk toast intolerant. You like that? I came up with that. I thought it was pretty good. Some of you are like, what, what's milk toast? Some of you remember what that meant. He's on the edge of civilization, as I said. And he's one of those guys that you would expect to be holding a sign that says, end of the world is coming. Repent. Be baptized. But you have to understand from his birth and even his early days when his parents were taken from him. Remember, it's probably maybe in childhood, early teens, that his father and his mother are no longer around. And so he probably ends up out in the wilderness with this group of Essenes. And like I said, they weren't known for just being casual. They're very extreme. John's under a Nazarite vow. No alcohol or strong drink. No haircuts. No touching any dead or unclean thing. A life since conception of absolute, total surrender to God. He actually sounds more like Krampus than Santa. But he is a life that is completely surrendered to God. I hear stories, I hear that in today's generation of young people, and this is why I haven't given up on our young generations that are coming, of those who are sensing a call to the Nazarite vow, and you can only do this through the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus complete surrender to Jesus' desire. Of youth who are so surrendered that they will go anywhere in the world. You go look up for yourself, YMAM and some of the organizations like that. Folks who are so obedient to God's will, they don't care if they end up being tortured for their faith in dark prisons of Mozambique or behind some enemy wall somewhere. They don't care because their lives are so consumed with God's love. They hear in the voice of everyone the cry of Jesus from the cross saying, I thirst. Are you one of those? I speak, and I'm speaking this morning to this congregation, but I am also speaking to those who will watch us and listen to this video and see us. I believe that there are those that this message is echoing and it's, it's reverberating in their heart and their mind today. There was a time when we sang, I have decided that I will follow. Jesus. In a day when folks so many times follow whatever the latest trend is, 
I believe that there are those here as well as those who are watching that this message is reverberating in. Would you hang an ornament of John the Baptizer on your Christmas tree? Probably not, but maybe we should rethink that. And if you have kids, that much more. Because I believe that this is a message of John and how sold out he was and how surrendered he was that is just so important. Important. We're preparing for Christmas. We're getting ready. Are you getting ready for Christmas? Oh my goodness. Are you watching all the movies? Got anybody forced to watch? Not forced to watch. I shouldn't have put it like that. Any of you men just joyfully want to watch Hallmark movies? If so, you can see the guys at the back. Just feel free to hand over that man card right now. We're preparing for Christmas. We're getting ready. But what about our hearts? Are they ready? And that's what Advent is so much about. Not just for the babe in Bethlehem, but for the soon coming king. And for what he's always desired to do in and around us. John represents major road construction in our hearts and lives needed before we come to Bethlehem's manger. John represents repentance, cleansing, rethinking our lives. He represents even to the point of maybe it's time to ditch the friends that are leading you into the wrong places and time to rethink that and say, God, I want you to bring the right people into my life. Somebody say amen this morning. Amen. Bring the right people that will set me on the right trajectory where I need to be going instead of ending up with those that are going to suck me down and put me in a place that moves me away. I don't care whether I'm talking to somebody who's 17 or I'm talking to somebody who's 97 in the house. You can be surrounded with the wrong folks in your life. And they carry you to destruction. Or you can be with those that God has in store for you, that God truly desires, and who get you in the right place. Not just financially, but they're going to get you there spiritually. Going to come alongside of you. Say, come on, let's go. Yeah, I know what yesterday held, but I believe that tomorrow there's something even bigger and better for you. We need John's message in verse 4, his preaching. Open your word with me, okay? Mark chapter 1, because there's a couple of scriptures I want to talk about. If I sound angry, I'm not angry. Can I just tell you that? Do I sound angry? Please forgive me. I've had this message and I've been brewing on it probably for over two weeks now. And right now with this message, I, I feel like I, I feel like I'm on the launching pad and I'm ready. Because <laughs> I, I really believe the Holy Spirit is on this. I don't want you to miss this, not even for a second. We need John's message in verse 4. You see that? It's preaching of a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. But that's only the first part. We also need verse 8, where John says what? He says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Who's he talking about? And what's Jesus going to baptize us with? So who baptizes with water? John. Who baptizes with the Holy Spirit? Yay, you pass. Bright church. 
great church. Great pastor. Good looking church. Pastor and who? We belong together. We need both that message that John had of repentance and forgiveness. We also need the second part that he brings, that Jesus is going to come and he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. I love how Matthew adds that it's not just the Holy Spirit, but with fire. John's is a baptism with water. Jesus is a baptism with fire, absolutely. Frequently, even as difficult as repentance might be, we're okay with John's baptism of repentance. I mean, it's what we hear all the time, right? But not so much with Jesus' baptism with the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed that? We get incredibly queasy when we start talking about Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, we're afraid somebody's going to make us Pentecostal. Listen, there are worse things to be accused of. You know what a fanatic is? It's just somebody who loves Jesus more than me. We're preparing a lot for Christmas, but are we seeking Christ and his baptism with the Holy Spirit? Did that make the top of your Christmas list? With the socks and the underwear, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that he's still in the business of baptizing us with the Holy Spirit? I mean, we're preparing a lot for Christmas. We bake cookies. In fact, there's going to be a cookie exchange next week. Where's Marianne? Yeah, amen. We string lights. We prepare for Big Music Sunday. Mr. Garlic, he's been working hard with the team. Those who are involved with it. How many of you are in Bell Choir? Yeah, get those hands up. Be proud. Bell Choir. With an attitude. <laughs> we prepare for Big Music Sunday, but are we seeking the best gift, the greatest gift that Jesus promised in the Holy Spirit? John says this, one greater than me in whom I trust. I mean, John gave a glowing endorsement of Jesus, even to his disciples, he said, go follow him. Go follow me. Go follow him. And so John throws his wholehearted endorsement behind Jesus. So let's look at verse 7 and 8. And he preached, saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we have John's baptism down, but we also need Jesus' baptism with the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk with you about that a little bit. John baptized in the depths of the water. Jesus baptizes in the full immersion in the Holy Spirit. Jesus' baptism is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a baptism, understand this, it's a baptism of love. Jesus' baptism in the Holy Spirit does an, an amazing number of things for us. It's a silver bullet, y'all. It does so much for us, and it's why we need his baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because among things, it helps us to love our neighbors, ourselves. This baptism also helps us to love ourselves. And forgive ourselves. Jesus' baptism in the Holy Spirit helps us to love our neighbors. Because you see, in our own effort, we can't. In our own effort, I mean, even in our own relationships with our wives and our, our husbands and our children, 
When we introduce the Holy Spirit and we say, I can only love, Lord, but so far. But Lord, give me your Holy Spirit. Baptize me in that baptism of love so I'm able to love like you love. See, to try to do that in our own effort is where we get frustrated and we fall short. But when it's a spirit-filled love that's coming forth, there's never any lack. Jesus' baptism, this is another thing. Jesus' baptism in the Holy Spirit, write this down. Jesus' baptism in the Holy Spirit helps us to love his word and gladly receive it when it's shared and preached. You see, on our own, we complain. We walk out of here. And I've heard folks walk out of here. I've heard like second or third hand reports that, of course, folks that complain don't know that I know, but I don't trust them. When they walk out and they say, I don't know, I didn't get a thing out of pastor's message today. I know it surprises me <laughs> that anyone would say such a thing. It's almost heretical. So what's the answer? It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see what, how serious I am about this? Because it's the filling by the filling of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the, thing, it's the Spirit who teaches us and reveals to us the things of God. And reveals to us the heart and reveals to us the scripture to us. So stop blaming the pastor. Stop blaming the worship team that they didn't do nothing for you. Stop blaming, oh, the, the light. Stop blaming the AC. Stop blaming whatever. The question is, are you filled with the Holy Spirit of God? And if it was important for John to lay it out in Scripture, and if it was important enough for Jesus to be part of it and to baptize in the Holy Spirit, how serious do you think we should take that today in church? How serious do you think we should? Yeah, I, I kind of think so. I think it's important. Turn with me over to Matthew 13, 15. See, only God can teach us the things of God. Jesus said, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. What were they needing? That which was to come. The filling of the Holy Spirit. But once we're filled with the Holy Spirit, He gives us an open. He opens our minds. He opens our hearts. Let me tell you, it doesn't just open our hearts and minds, but He gives us such a hunger for God and the things of God so that when the Word, we come and encounter the Word, that the Word just jumps up off the page and we receive it joyfully. And we say, Lord, what, you, what is your word teaching me? What it, what it, okay, Lord, I, okay, I see that. I'm going to open myself to that. Here's another thing that the Holy Spirit helps us to do. He helps us to speak well, not only of our pastor, but those in godly authority. We're talking about our council. We're talking about our president of the council. We're talking about who, those who lead us in worship. He, the Holy Spirit helps us to do that. We can't do that because by our nature, we are by nature, in our sinful nature, opposed to godly leadership and godly authority. It's just part of who we are. We're born with our backs toward sin, toward God. Our, we're born with our backs toward God. We, we are more prone 
to go against the things that are of God. And so part of that is any kind of godly authority. And how do we overcome that? How does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen in our own natural ability because we can't. It happens only by the baptism and filling of the Holy Spirit. How do we stop carrying grudges? How do we stop with the bitterness of our hearts? We can't do it apart from the baptism of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me, church? How do we pray? The baptism of the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Do you realize that? The baptism of the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Jesus said, pray without ceasing. He said, it's my desire that all people should pray. He believed so much in prayer that he taught people to pray. He was such an advocate. And then on the day of Pentecost... There was, a, there was the, the, outful, the outpouring of the gift of tongues. He pours out the ability of tongues as well as interpretation tongues. And he also gives us an ability to pray in a prayer language so that his will and his heart might be done. And he also pours out in Romans 8, 26 and 27. He says the Holy Spirit will pray for us. That's one of the greatest prayers we can ever pray. Holy Spirit, would you pray for me? I prayed, started praying that prayer over about two years ago, and my life totally radically changed. I knew I'd stumbled upon a gold mine when I started praying that, and then I started praying that for my wife and for my kids. Holy Spirit, pray for me. Just as you come forward and receive prayer, imagine yourself coming forward and asking, Holy Spirit, would you pray for me? Why? Because he lines up what is on our minds with the Father's mind so that, that his will can be done. You've heard me talk about this before. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, do you mind if I go a little longer? You know, there's a fine line between a line of between there's a fine line between a long message and a hostage taking. <laughs> I can't give this to you without your permission. Spirit can only receive what the fanny can endure. <laughs> she giggled on that one. The baptism of the Holy Spirit helps us to share Christ and to build up the church. You don't believe me? Look at Acts 1.8. Flip over there. Jesus says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's the first part. Empowerment. And the second part is what do you use that power for? Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You see, on our own, we can't share Christ. We won't share Christ. Not even get lucky and end up sharing Christ. It's only through the Holy Spirit that we're able to share Jesus. Because who is it that empowers us to share the Holy Spirit? It comes through the baptism, the filling of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall, in, in truth, you shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Listen, let me, let me give you a secret. A church will not grow in numbers with 
without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe me? Yes. Let me say that again. A church will not grow in numbers without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's not because of a clever marketing plan. It's not because of Meta or Facebook or TikTok or I don't care whatever. I don't even know all that stuff. It doesn't grow just because of small groups. It doesn't grow because you read a book like Purpose Driven Church or Purpose Driven Life or read The Best of Rick Warren or Henry Blackaby or anything else. It happens solely through the baptism and the filling of the... Through the Holy Spirit. Now let's go back to the principle, the first or second principle. Who baptizes with water? Who baptizes with the Holy Spirit? Jesus. Oh, really? I thought it was the pastor's responsibility to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Because it's the pastor's job to increase the numbers in a church, right? Thank you, sister. That's right. It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if I be lifted up... I will draw all people unto me. We can't lift Jesus up without the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Am I out to make this church a Pentecostal church? No. I am out to make, see, this church has always has been a Bible-believing, Spirit-filled church. It flashes on that sign every three seconds. Angie, make sure that happens. Amen, Angie? Amen. What are we? A Bible-believing, Spirit-filled church. Many are baptized with water. A few are filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of you are not going to be happy with me because you're going to be like, well, what about baptism? Let me tell you what baptism does. I, I haven't got this all figured out. But my hunch is, as I see it, and according to the word, because something powerful happens in baptism. That's like the place where the pilot light gets lit. If I talk about pilot lights, do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody got a gas burn on fireplace? Yeah. Anybody just have gas? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Some of us just have heartburn. <laughs> At baptism, the Holy Spirit comes and lights that pilot light. So that when it comes time and we're kindled to faith or the gifts of the Holy Spirit are needed for such a time in the believer's life, <clears throat> up comes the big, the, the big furnace, up comes the big roaring fire. It's enough to singe Santa's tail feathers. It's because the power of the Holy Ghost You think I just made this up? This is biblical. Even Luther said this in his explanation of the third article of the creed. Follow with me. And if you know this by, by memory, you're better than I am. But I'm going to give it a shot, okay? I believe in the Holy Spirit. What did Luther say about that? He says, what does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in... Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith in the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole church, whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this, earth, in this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me 
and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers. And where are my confirmation students? Good, we got at least one here and one out there. The Holy Spirit empowers you to be part of Jesus' ministry of the greater things. You know, Jesus said, if you believe in me, greater things are you going to do. You want to cast out demons. You want to be part of those who lay hands on the sick and that they, re that they recover. We're not talking about some great manipulation of somebody's spine, right, Jane? We're talking that it only happens through the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Apart from that, we got no power. How much power? No power. Who helps us to worship? Jesus said, the time is coming is now here when the true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. Who helps us worship in spirit and truth? And I gave it away, didn't I? The Holy Spirit. In our own, we will constantly find fault with hymns, with worship, with the pastor, with godly authority, with, uh, even in the process of worship. Oh, that song went too long. Why do we have to sing that over and over? Why do they have to stand there and do this? When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God so has your heart. And it's a time when your heart is so connecting with the Father's heart. Man, you don't care what you look like. You can be a sobbing, wet mess down on the floor, bawling your eyes out. You can be standing up. You can be dancing. Well, I happen to know of a former king of Israel that when the Holy Spirit got hold of him, he danced all around the altar. Oh, oh. How undignified. John was filled with the Holy Spirit even when he was in his mother. Because at Mary's voice, what happened? Scripture says he leapt within her. Oh, man, that's what I want. Any of you mamas remember the first time your baby kicked? God help poor Elizabeth because that baby didn't just kick. He was cheating and he was doing the Texas two-step <laughs> and maybe doing some break dancing. <laughs> Down on the floor. I'm going to show you right now. No. <laughs> Don't pay enough for that. That's not happening. All right, well, I can't tell you that without telling you this. Ask Jesus to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Could you put that on your Christmas list? Are you content with mediocre Christianity? Just stay there. But if inside of you, you've always known that there is something more, I invite you to just ask Jesus to baptize you and fill you with the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus said, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will I give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? It's his desire. Is Jesus cheap? Heck no. He's got this cross here to prove it. Here's another thing in asking for the Holy Spirit. You can't ask for him and hang on to old sin and old attitudes when you've spoken against him. Ask him to forgive you for the times you've spoken against legitimate things that the Holy Spirit has done and you've said, that's not a God. Repent of attitudes against the Holy Spirit. Do you have people? It's fascinating because I've come to realize 
I prayed with a lot of people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and a number of them have not received. And then we come back and I say, are there people in your life that you will not forgive? And they say, yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to forgive that person. And when they take those initial steps to issue forgiveness, boom, that's when they get baptized with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes they pray in an unknown language. Sometimes they just have the boldness. Sometimes it just ignites their worship. Sometimes it just ignites their hunger for the scriptures. The Holy Spirit reveals himself and in so many different ways. But asking God to forgive you, asking God to help you to forgive others is a great another way to start. Also, sometimes we've been taught this idea throughout, church, throughout the church. It's called cessationism. And that's the idea that, when, that God no longer acts in the miraculous. I know, it surprises me. That he no longer baptizes and fills his kids with the Holy Spirit. Can you believe such a thing? Like that was just a thing for the age of the apostles. Maybe you've been under that teaching. Would you be willing to ask Jesus to forgive you for that teaching? And to allow him to show you other ways? Listen. This is the last of the message. You can continue to hear about this baptism of the Holy Spirit because it really is what makes a difference. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your, your saints. And they've been so patient. But Lord, I pray that, that this season of Advent, this second Sunday of Advent, that they would ask you more than anything. And if they have ever been filled with your Holy Spirit, that they would ask you again, Lord, refill me with your spirit. Refill me with your gifts. Stir up your life, O oh Lord, in me and come. Lord, I repent of my old attitudes. I repent of my sin. Come and fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I acknowledge false teachings on the spirit. But I'm willing to be open to you. I'm willing to allow you to speak in your word and to show me how real you are in your word and how real your spirit is. The Lord, do everything in me that you always long to do. Fill me again and again, not just with a little bit, but Lord, to overflowing. Set me ablaze for you, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Rise and join me in reading the Apostles' Creed found on page 85 of your Green Lutheran Book of Worship. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share in that peace.